Today we're going to talk about the NIH Stroke Scale. We'll begin by talking about the purpose of the NIH Stroke Scale and then how to accurately interpret it and to perform each component. So let's start by talking a little bit about what the NIH Stroke Scale is. It's a scale that describes stroke severity. It's a way to quantify the exam, to determine if a patient's improving or deteriorating, and to communicate their status. The scale is based on 11 items that integrate components of the, inter of the neurologic examination, including the mental status, cranial nerves, motor, sensory, and cerebellar functions. It's scored on a scale of 0 to 42, but it's important to note that it's not linear, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. It's also important to point out what the NIH stroke scale is not. It's not a surrogate marker for the neurologic examination, which is a diagnostic evaluation that allows us to localize. The NIH stroke scale measures severity of symptoms, but it's insufficient for localization, as it encompasses only a portion of the exam. The score is useful because it's relatively quick, easy, standardized, reproducible, and useful to communicate severity to others. However, it grossly underestimates the right hemisphere, as well as the posterior circulation, and it shouldn't substitute for a comprehensive exam. When performing the NIH stroke scale, it's important to remember that the most reproducible response is going to be the first, so that's the one you should record even if the patient changes their response. Please don't coach them and record only what they do, not what you think they can do. This can be really hard for neurologists because we've been taught to localize the lesion and that certain symptoms should run together, so we have expectations about the results. Finally, some items should be scored only if they're definitely present, for example, neglect, and we'll talk about that when we get there. So let's go through the NIH stroke scale in some detail and discuss clinical pearls that you may find useful. We'll start with level of consciousness. This is graded um, on, uh, on a scale of 0 to 3, with 0 being given when the individual is normal, awake, and alert, and 3 when they're unresponsive or exhibit only reflexive behavior. It's always important to start nicely and gradually increase your level of stimulation because the last thing you want to do is march in and sternal rub a patient who's simply asleep because you thought they were comatose. Believe me, this happens. The second part of uh, the assessment of level of consciousness is the ability to answer questions. You ask the patient their age and the month. This is one of those where the first response is the most reliable and, re and reproducible, and there's no partial credit given. Patients who are intubated or unable to speak for some other reason other than aphasia are scored a 1. The third part of item 1 assesses the ability to follow commands. This is assessed by asking the patient to open their eyes, then close them, and to squeeze your hand. Credit is given if an attempt is made that demonstrates understanding. For example, if they're too weak to do it, but try. Item number two is best gaze. You ask the patient to follow your finger with their eyes to assess the horizontal eye movements. The point of this is to see if the eyes can fully bury bilaterally. So if they're not understanding, it is okay to move around the room and get them to track you, or to coach. You can use the oculocephalic maneuver in the unconscious individual. One point's given for a partial gaze paresis. See how the patient on the left's unable to fully look to his right? And two points is given for forced gaze deviation when they can't cross midline. Item three is assessment of visual fields. Ask the patient to look directly into your eyes or at your nose. Then test all quadrants by confrontation testing. Finger counting's more sensitive to picking up a deficit than motion is. You should use yourself as a control and place your hands about halfway between you and them. Visual fields are scored on a scale of 0, which is normal, to 3, which is blind. A 1 is given for a quadrantinopsia and 2 for a hemianopsia. If there's unilateral blindness or inoculation of the eye, which has happened with several patients at Bayview, the good eye should be used to assess fields. Item number four is facial palsy, which is also scored on a scale of zero to three. Ask the patient to smile, but if they're aphasic or confused, you can also use symmetry of grimace to stimulation. Zero and three are easy. Zero is normal, and three is a loader, lower motor neuron palsy that involves both the upper and lower face, so they have an asymmetric smile and forehead wiggle. Differentiating a one from a two can be difficult. Both involve the lower face. I like to use the grandmother test. If your grandma can tell there's a droop, it's likely major and a two. If not, it's minor and a one. Five and six are motor, arm, and leg. They should be performed with one limb at a time. 
the patient holds up the limb in the upper extremity for the count of 10 and for the count of 5 in the lower extremity. Count out loud and you can pantomime and encourage, particularly the aphasic patients. One of the hardest concepts is that of dip versus drift. A dip is a very small change with an instantaneous correction and that doesn't get any points. With drift, the limb is lowered to the bed a significant uh, degree and is not normal. It's scored a one if it doesn't actually hit the bed. If the arm hits the bed, you ask them to try to move it sideways, which removes gravity from the equation. If there's no movement, it's a four. No effort against gravity, but some movement is a three, and some effort to pick up the arm is a two. Points are not given if the patient has an amputation. It's just not scored. And here's the motor scoring for both the arm and the leg. Limb ataxia is assessed to look for cerebellar lesions. This is important because people can be ataxic because they're weak. So ataxia must be out of proportion to the weakness in order to give points. Use finger to nose and heel to shin to assess each limb separately. Ataxia is also only scored if it's present. So if the patient's paralyzed, they don't get any points. Sensation is assessed using a pin or other sharp object over both sides of the face, arms, and legs. Only sensory loss due to strokes recorded, so not peripheral neuropathy, for example. The easiest way to think about this is that a zero is normal, two is when they can't feel they're being touched at all, and one is somewhere in between. Item nine is language assessment, and you have several tools in your stroke scale cards to help with this. Typically, we assess naming, repetition, and comprehension. I love the cookie jar picture. When you have the patient describe what they see, you get an idea of their fluency, naming, and if they may have attentional deficits, to one side of space. I also use the naming cards and have them read. You can also have them write if you're having a hard time figuring out if they're truly aphasic, as writing should parallel their spoken deficits. You can use this, for example, in the intubated patient. Aphasia is scored on a scale of zero to three. Zero is normal and three is mute or globally aphasic. Distinguishing between a one and a two is more subjective. In general, if they're missing more than two thirds of the naming objects or only understanding a few simple one-step commands, I'd call them severe and score them a two. Item 10 is dysarthria and assessed by both listening to the patient and having them read from the cards. You can't score this if they're intubated, but they don't get any points either. The hardest part, is deciding between mild versus severe, but usually it's relatively straightforward. Item 11 is assessment of attention or hemispatial neglect that occurs typically with large right hemisphere lesions in the MCA territory. Patients have impaired attention and only attend to things on one side of space, usually the right. You can see this when you look at the line cancellation task in the upper right corner where the patient was asked to cross out all the lines and they only identified lines on the right. If neglect is severe enough, the patient may not even recognize their own left side, so they think the arm or their leg isn't their own. Or they may only eat things on the right half of their plate. It's pretty cool. For the NIH stroke scale, uh, neglect is assessed both through visual and tactile stimulation. When you assess visual fields, you should also provide stimulation bilaterally. If the patient extinguishes or fails to pay attention to the fingers presented on their left when presented with bilateral stimulation, they get a point for that. You can perform this tactile stimulation during sensory testing. If they extinguish, again, typically on the left with bilateral stimulation, they get another point. They have to be able to feel on the left, though, in order for you to be able to sort out whether it's neglect or just a problem with sensation. So now that you've completed the NIH stroke scale, does that potentially tell you about patient outcome? Well, a study by DeGraba et al. in 1999 showed that seven was an important cut point. Scores above seven were 65% likely to exhibit worsening over their hospitalization, probably because they had larger strokes that swell and have the potential to herniate. Schlegel et al. in 2003 showed that NIH stroke scale was actually a good predictor of discharge disposition, which can be helpful in early planning and counseling of families. It is important to note that the NIH stroke scale is not linear, 
a two point jump from an NIH stroke scale of one to three because someone goes from having a mild drift to frank hemiparesis or accumulates a new deficit is a big deal, while increasing from a baseline score of 20 may simply represent variability of the examiner. So how good is the reliability of the NIH stroke scale between examiners? This study looked at the reliability of scores given to videotaped assessments between those well-trained in its administration. You can see that there's actually quite a bit of variability for many of the items. However, in general, the scores for motor, sensory, and visual field testing have a higher level of inter-rater reliability. Those are the ones listed in green. So it's important to remember that when there is a reported change in NIH stroke scale, it may represent inter-rater variability, particularly if the difference is only one to two points. However, one should consider the baseline score of the patient and become more concerned for true deterioration and consider further assessment when the score change involves the motor, sensory, or visual systems. In conclusion, the NIH stroke scale is a relatively quick, easy, and standardized way to assess and communicate stroke severity. It can be a useful tool, but it shouldn't replace the neurologic examination for diagnosis and localization.